So I may assume you'll do a little intro. I wasn't prepared to, but I'm happy to. Welcome everybody. <laughs> um, thank you to, thank you, welcome to the second um, of four webinars um, on facilitating community participation in community owned renewable energy projects. Um, thank you to Sustainability Victoria and the Community Hubs program for making these webinars possible. Um, I'll let Jarrah introduce herself, but um, uh, the comments I would make is that uh, we're really privileged to have Jarrah's knowledge being shared with us in the community this way. Um, four years of studying a PhD specifically on the topic of um, benefit sharing and community participation in in community energy projects um, means that we've got a lot of lot of knowledge being shared with us through these four webinars. So um, uh, over to you in a second, Jero. Just a bit of housekeeping. There is um, a and A panel, uh, so please familiar yourself with the familiarise yourself with the controls uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we'll it'll be my job to field the questions and answers. Um, we'll We'll, what's our plan, Jarrah? Are we going to do questions at, at the end or at the end of sections? So I've, yeah, I've allocated um, some questions. There's, there's three sections in the talk and I've allocated question time at the end of each section. So um, while you can post your question whenever you like, we'll come to addressing questions at the end of each section. Great. Yeah, so do that. Familiar, Familiarise yourself with the Q&A session. The other thing you might want to use is the chat panel, um, but uh, try to ask questions in the Q&A. That'll just make, make my job of um, facilitating, facilitating the questions a, a lot easier. Um, this is a webinar, so it's just a one-way flow of information. There's no, um, there's no sort of participation on your side as attendees. You're, you're hearing us and seeing us. We can't hear you or see you. Over to you, Jarrah. Great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I generally like to deliver content in a way that is a lot more participatory, where I can at least see your faces and, and get feedback and we can have more of a conversation. So while this is a little bit of an awkward platform, I do really appreciate the opportunity um, to share this knowledge and, and I really do appreciate your interest in hearing it as well. Um, so. Sorry, let me just figure out here how to change the slides. There we go. Um, as Tom has already mentioned, this whole webinar series is really about how do we participate, how do we facilitate strong community participation in our community-owned renewable energy projects. Um, last week we covered um, an overview and an introduction to the topic, and it was really the most conceptual of the four weeks. Um, and and the next three weeks, including this week, are much more practical. Um, so th this week is focused on the economic arrangements of a community renewable energy project and the types of facilitate, um, the types of participation that you can build into your project through the different economic choices that you make. Um, so the, the whole purpose is really getting, it's aimed at um, community energy practitioners, so people who are out there doing this work on the ground, thinking about how to deliver your projects or um, so whether you're sort of in the thick of it already or just starting out, it's really helping us, the idea is to help us think through the design options that we have at hand um, so that we can really make sure there's a really strong role for the community in our projects and in many different aspects of our projects. Um, as we'll cover tonight, there's there's lots of different possible economic arrangements and I'll explain what I mean by that term, but it's basically where money comes from and, and where money goes to and, and how that how all those processes happen. Um, but there's lots of different economic arrangements that can come together to make our renewable energy projects viable and stack up um, and make sense and meet the objectives we want them to meet. So this webinar is going to look at a whole diverse range of economic practices um, that community energy groups draw on in the process of setting their projects up and maintaining their projects over time, including donations and volunteering and in-kind and community investment and um, share offers and 
um, all of these things and we'll analyse what each of those different options mean for the ways that people participate and the types of benefits that flow from that. Um, I'll be drawing on four main case study examples. Two of them are Australian and two of them are from Scotland. And as Tom mentioned, all of this content, the really rich, deep content I'm presenting is from my PhD thesis. Um, but I will also be bringing in other examples um, from Australian community energy projects, um, and including a few examples from the Community Power Hubs program that's been running in Victoria. So this particular webinar, um, it, it won't cover all possible finance and economic arrangements, in community energy, it will just specifically look at those ones that relate to how we build strong participation. So in terms of what we're going to be um, covering, I'll do a quick review of last week just in case there's people here who, who haven't had a chance yet to listen to that webinar. It is recorded so you are able to catch up, but I'll just do a quick recap to make sure we're all on the same page because I am going to be using some of those concepts in today's, in today's webinar. Um, then we'll have a little Q&A session just to make sure everyone's sort of up to date on that. And we'll move into talking about um, the whole diversity of economic arrangements that, um, that can be drawn on to deliver community energy projects in a participatory way. And we'll look at um, how, how it is that each of those either facilitate or restrict participation. Um, so that's sort of a general setting, setting the scene. We'll, then we'll have some question and answer time. And then I'll delve into um, some case study examples. And I'll give you examples of um, member-based finance, including investments and donations, um, local jobs and local contracts, the, the value and contribution of in-kind and voluntary labour and gifted contributions, um, and we'll look at where the surplus, uh, the value of partnerships, and also where your surplus goes. So surplus is often referred to as profit, but um, surplus is you know everything that's left over after you've covered your costs. What happens to that? Um, and that, then at the end, we'll talk about what's coming next in the webinar series and how that relates to what we've heard today. So as a quick review of last week. Um, Last week we looked at um, the, the variety of different motivations that, that drive community energy projects and community power agency we've consolidated the many different motivations that we've seen driving projects um, into this diagram here. And these are both you know, what drives the project but then also hopefully what comes out the other end as the outcomes from the project. Um, and Participation is particularly important for delivering all of those outcomes in the orange circle, all of those social outcomes, but it's also important to delivering a lot of the local economic benefit outcomes. So um, we see participation as being really, really crucial um, to delivering the social context that is going to support the rap a rapid transition to renewable energy, so building that that base of understanding and support within the community that is ready to accept renewable energy, ready to do it in their own homes and in their own communities. Um, participation also helps to build the, a strong connection with the projects and an understanding of the political environment that they're operating in and that motivation to participate in the politics and to push for better policies to do with renewables. Um, it also increases local benefit from renewable energy because the local people are involved, um, both in you know, the economic side of things but also socially in terms of delivering local benefits around community building and empowerment. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we see participation in community energy projects as being a really fundamental aspect of what defines a community energy project, but it's not always obvious um, how to deliver participation. It's something that we often strive for, but in the midst of everything else that's going on can sometimes be forgotten and it's not automatic. We have to be conscious about how we build participation in um, and we need to give it the attention that we give to the technical aspect, for example. And, and Jarrah, core is? 
Oh, sorry, core. I always, I just put it on the front slide. It's community owned renewable energy. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. So, um, so this week, of course, we're focused on how we design the economic arrangements or the economic aspects of our community owned renewable energy projects. Um, and I'll just quickly touch on what I mean by this concept of design and of enterprise design. Um, so I think of it enterprise design as being the process of consciously designing our enterprise or our, our organization or our business to meet our practical and ethical requirements. So we're, we're thinking about what our objectives are, what our values are, we're feeding that into a design process to figure out the, the form and the shape and the detail of this project so that it can deliver on those motivations and values in real life. Um, so it's about purposefully establishing all the different aspects of the project, including the financial aspect that we're talking about tonight. Um, so this is just a bit of a schema for, for how at Community Power Agency we think about this design process of a project where your, your vision and values, your motivations feed in from one side, they influence those four aspects in the middle, those four aspects of an enterprise's design. Um, so the organisational structure, the community engagement, the technical aspects, and of course the bits that we're talking about tonight, which is all about the economics, which includes the finance and the fundraising. But of course you're also operating in, in a context and there's external factors that are going to influence and limit and enable the different choices that you make. And this certainly applies for your economic arrangement. So just quickly in terms of thinking about a community owned renewable energy, a core enterprise, um, last week I introduced these four aspects. Um, these are the aspects we'll be speaking to in each of the webinars. Um, below, underneath each of the aspects, there's different features. So these are the level of detail underneath that really build up the body of the project. So under your economic arrangements, your different features that we'll be focusing on tonight are things like volunteering might be a feature, a share offer might be a feature, um, a community grant fund might be another feature. So that's, that's the, the idea that you build your project up and through each of those different features, there's opportunities to build in active participation. Last week I also introduced this, um, this diagram which I call a participation footprint diagram. Um, what it's showing is a whole range of indicators around the outside. So each of those, those radial arms, each of those arms of the spider web are a different indicator that relate to a type of participation in the project. Um, so, you know, for example, local involvement in setting the vision and the design of the project or the percentage of local ownership. Each of the different coloured lines is a different project, um, a different case study. Where you lose track of one of the lines, it's because uh, a different line is immediately over the top of it. So, for example, the blue line and the green line share a border for some of the um, so some of the, the outside of the, the spider web there. Um, what this is indicating is the, the projects relative to each other and relative to these indicators um, shows sort of the general orientation to participation. So in the middle of the spider web is a weaker orientation and in the, at the outside of the spider web is a stronger level of participation. Um, so the point is not necessarily who sits where, who's stronger or weaker, but it's understanding why projects are different. Um, and if it's important for us to have strong participation, we need to understand how we can build that in. And this diagram helps us to see the differences that different choices make when we add them all together um, into this visual representation of the footprint. The footprint of participation. So the larger the space encompassed by the, the line, the more participation there has been. So I'll be using this um, diagram as we go through tonight to, to explore the different choices of the different case studies and how that's influenced their footprint. 
but in an uh, in in essence, the particip participation footprint is a way of mapping the many diverse opportunities that exist for participation within an enterprise, um, and then helping us to see the difference visually across a range of indicators. <clears throat> okay, so that's the, the quick recap from last week. A very rushed version, but I don't want to labour it in case all of you have listened to last week. So we'll pause just now for some questions, if there are any. Sorry. Um, I've got a question um, about the participation footprint. What, what sort of practical real-world applications might you see the participation footprint be, being used? Yep. Um, so I think if, say, if you're designing a community energy project and you have a bunch of different options for how you can do different parts of your project, and one of your key motivators is um, wanting to really involve local people and wanting to um, build that sense of connection and build all those outcomes that come from participation, all those social outcomes, but also maybe the local economic benefit that is you need local participation to deliver. So it could help you weigh up different options um, for different ways that you could structure your project so that um, and you could analyse the influence that has on participation. Right. Or, or for example, you know, in an assessment pro process, um, if you're tr trying to assess um, the different levels of local participation from different established projects, you know, for example, um, I don't know if they ended up using it, but we did recommend that this could be part of the evaluation process um, for the renewable energy auction in Victoria because they were interested to know what has been the level of local benefit. So you'd have to adapt the indicators, but you could use the concept. Um, and that's what I explained last week. The indicators are not hard and fast. They're not the only indicators you could use. You can tailor the indicators um, to explore what you what you want to explore. Yeah, which leads to a second question. I just questions from me. We've got two questions from attendees, which leads to my second question, which is presumably you could use the footprint concept and, and expand it beyond just participation measures if you wanted to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, so um, back on the previous slide, the footprint example you brought up. Uh, this is a question from Kevin. Is the number of members a percentage of local members or is it an absolute number? Um, uh, the percentage here. of local ownership? Yep. Yeah, from zero, zero to 100. Oh, it's, yeah. oh, but down here we've got um, at the bottom, yep. at uh, approaching 6 p.m., we've got uh, 6 o'clock, we've got number of members. Yep. Yeah, it would, yeah. It would be numbers, presumably. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be the overall number of members. So, um, you know, for Shappancy and for Hepburn, they've got, they both had thousands of members. So um, that's why they're sitting way out on the very edge, whereas for um, Sky there were 600 and for Denmark there were 116. So, so I suppose if you were using this, sorry, go on. Yep. No, so it's relative to these projects. It's showing these yeah. projects relative to each other. It's, yeah. So there's, yeah. there's no absolute, there's no right or wrong. Um, it's showing the relative performance of these different projects to each other so that we can understand the influence of different design features. Yep, yep, understood. And I was going to say, if you were using this to evaluate, say, a program, then you might yep. not use raw numbers, you might use relative numbers, percentages, say. So it actually, it actually could be either, depending on what you're trying to use it for. Yes, that's right. Yep. It, it's a flexible tool. And I think, I think that's part of its strength, um, is mm. that you can set those indicators to something that makes sense in your context. Cool. And because, because uh, I was analysing participation, these are ones I came up with. Lovely. Uh, another question from Genevieve. Can we take the outer circle as the indicator of the best way to go on any one of those aspects? Um, 
Look, I would say that what's best in a local context is very locally specific, and I'm not trying to make a value judgment here. Um, I'm just trying to show how different choices have influenced participation. So if your project is really driven by wanting high levels of participation, then yeah, you're going to want to be on the outside of, of the web. But invariably you have to, you know, you're operating in a context and you need to weigh up different options and there's different practicalities and different limitations. So what this footprint can also help you see is, well, maybe we compromise in this spot, but we make up for it by being really full on this other side. So it, could, it can help you maybe think through um, and identify when maybe you're compromising too much and you're shrinking that footprint too much and you're not comfortable with that actually. So you want to try to find ways to bring it back out again. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make any absolute judgments about this. It's, it's, it's an exploratory tool and what's going to make sense for your project in your community is going to be different from, from these case studies that I'm, I'm sharing with you. Great. Thank you. We don't have any more questions, so I think on we go. Mm-hmm. Okay, dokie. So, um, in this next section, I'm going to speak to you about um, sort of the generally what I what I refer to as the economic arrangements and the diversity of economic options that we see being used in community-owned renewable energy. Um, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, community-owned renewable energy projects are not, they're not just smaller versions of large corporate development. There's a lot of things that um, vary significantly with community energy. Um, and community energy projects vary between, you know, from project to project, as well as varying from the norms of renewable indus energy industry and in the way that the, the corporate industry develops projects um, and some of the ways that they differ are, are those motivations and those ethics driving the, the project but it's also fundamentally different in the way that the community is engaged, genuinely engaged, involved um, in a really high impact and important way. Um, and one of the areas I think where community energy projects are most different when you look at the detail is in the economic arrangements. Um, so as many of you, I'm sure many of you are involved in community energy projects and you would know that it can be very difficult to make the finances of a project stack up and it can be difficult to access the level of finance that you need um, as well as the other resources you might need to, to bring a project to fruition. Um, and in most cases, you know, setting up a multi-million dollar, multi-megawatt project, not, not that all community energy projects are that big, but, you know, if, if we are thinking about the megawatt range, it's very complex um, and it's not something that a community is necessarily familiar with and you're operating in a highly regulated environment that's dominated by very large corporations and very established market dynamics. So it can be really difficult um, to, to make it work. Um, but one of the strengths that community energy projects have is that they have a diversity of economic tools at their disposal and a whole range of economic tools that aren't available to corporate projects, um, as we'll see in, in a minute. One of the challenges too is um, for community energy projects, you know, if they turn to mainstream finance um, options like, you know, going to a bank for a loan, they might not be suited to the nature of the project um, and the nature, the fact that you want to retain local ownership and control or that you want to retain local economic benefit. Um, but it also might not, you know, those actors, you know, banks and, and so forth might really not understand community energy. So those, those, those conventional finance mechanisms simply might not be available. So we need to be creative um, about how we go about funding. Our project. So attention to the economic aspect of a project includes attention to some design questions um, around the financing, around the market interactions, around labour arrangements and around surplus or profit distribution. So these are thinking through questions like 
where does the money come from, both for your capital costs and for your feasibility costs? Are you interested in grants, loans, investment donations or different sources at different stages of the project? Um, are you going to need to deliver a certain rate of return to your investors? And what's their appetite for for um, for needing a return? And it's probably a lot lower than some of the commercial counterparts. Um, is there a clear idea for who's buying and selling the electricity? What are the options there? Um, and yeah, how is the, the money that's left over after your costs have been accounted for? How is that going to be distributed? And how does that help you to fulfill your motivations? For example, you know, how does it help you to deliver local economic benefits? Um, so all of these questions are the questions you'll be asking as part of your designing your, the economic aspect of your project. I think of economic arrangement um, as being a whole range of different arrangements within a project. And I use the phrase economic arrangement so that because it's broader than finance and it, it's, um, it includes both monetary and non-monetary aspects. Um, so in terms of the, the money-based aspects or the monetary aspects, it's thinking about, you know, where does your cash flow come from and, and where does your cash flow go to? So it, come, it might come from investments, donations, grants, and it might go to your running costs, your staff, your returns on investment and your maybe, you know, your community benefit, however that might be facilitated. But then there's also a whole bunch of non-money based, non-cash um, economic arrangements that are, we often forget about, but these are really valuable and they're really important to tease out and un understand. Um, so that's thinking about where do your non-monetary contributions come from? And this is things like vol volunteering and in kind and gifts that you might receive from the community, from individuals, but also from businesses and organizations in the community. Um, and then there's where the non-monetary benefits go to, including your things around your SLO being social license to operate, your reputational benefits, your brand, your community development benefits, your awareness, your skill building, all of that really broad range of, um, of non-monetary benefits. <clears throat> so, there, there is a cash budget um, and there is a need to bring in cash, but there's also a whole bunch of non-cash based economic um, transactions that go on and help make community energy projects viable. Um, so this is a spectrum that just represents some of the, the options that, that you need to think about when you're thinking about um, your economic arrangement. Um, particularly when you're exploring where, where's the money coming from and where is the financial benefit going to. Um, so on one side of the spectrum, it shows that, the that all of the surplus goes to a community benefit fund for community, purely for community benefit. Um, and I'll be talking through an example of this um, later on, but for example, where where a community energy project is owned by a not-for-profit organisation, all of the electricity savings and all of the income they might earn from selling electricity is fed back into achieving their charitable purpose, whatever that may be. And that's, that's usually, you know, for broad community benefit. On the other end of the spectrum is that you've sourced your finance from non-local investors, so from people far away, um, and so all of your surplus, all of your profit is being returned as returns on investment to people somewhere else, um, leaving the local economy, but also possibly the national economy. So that this would be a classic scenario for a corporate renewable energy um, project. And then within within those two spectrums, there's a lot of different positions, and and I've just articulated three here for the purpose of of exploring the different options. Um, so. We might have an option where the surplus is, is delivered partly back to local investors and there's been rules around who can invest, so it's mostly local people. Um, and so those dividends, those returns are returned to local people. But that, that's balanced with also prioritising some of your surplus going towards community benefits 
um, broad community benefit, for example, through a community grant fund or the like. Um, so that sort of gives you a sense of, of the different options and, and how that relates to the different um, impacts in a community energy project. So in terms of um, the options available for participation within our economic arrangements, there's a lot of different ways that, that the community can participate. Can participate. Um, so obviously there's, there's the possibility that a project can raise capital finance through issuing, issuing a share offer. Um, so, um, yeah, issuing shares and, and in some instances a lot of projects have prioritised local members, so it's local shareholders that hold the majority of the shares. Um, people also participate through um, in-kind contributions, so local businesses, for example, donating staff time or equipment or space. Um, people also contributing through volunteering time. Most community energy projects take a really significant amount of voluntary time, both in the setup but also in the ongoing management and operations of a project. Um, people also um, giving gifts to the project to help make it happen. So, um, yeah, people giving materials and resources that they might have. You know, a great example for is um, one of the projects um, having a float in the Easter parade and all of the materials to, to make that float happen, which was a great opportunity for celebration and for public engagement. That all came from people just gifting various things um, to the project so they could have the float. Um, similarly, building partnerships. So when you're, when you're on the ground and you're working in a way that's really engaged with the local community, you can build important partnerships um, with other local projects, with other local businesses. And this can, can lead to maybe sometimes to economies of scale um, and the ability to do a bulk purchase or to benefit from sharing knowledge and resources. Um, and then, of course, there's participation through local procurement and, and um, local jobs and using local contractors. So that's an overview of the, the different ways, different possible ways. And there's also other ways that I, that I haven't referenced here, things like issuing um, green bonds or issuing cooperative credit unit, units um, where people participate in, in raising finance through means other than share offering. So just jump in there. Is, um, I'll, just, yep. I'll just jump in there, Jarrod. There was a question that came up which said, why don't we include payments for energy in where does the money come from? And I think you just partially answered that tangentially. Yeah, so um, payments for energy, yep, obviously a really, really important source of, of the income. Um, I haven't looked at it in terms of the participation simply because um, all of the case studies I've looked at and the market conditions in Australia at the moment mean that your your members are not there's not a participation element to selling your energy. You're usually selling it to to one entity to a lot, you know to a corporate retailer. But um, absolutely, it's an important income stream. Mm. Yeah, and, and there's no reason it couldn't be if the market conditions or the business model were structured to support it. Absolutely, and with retailers yeah. like Nova, that is a community-owned energy retailer, that is building in layers of community participation into your retail contract um, in some ways. So absolutely, um, I, I don't mean for any of this to be exhaustive, and sometimes you know, it's really great that you raise that because I haven't mentioned it and it is really important. Um, yeah, so what I'm, the, men, the methods I'm speaking to are not all of the methods you can consider, they're just some of them and, and they're being presented as a way to explore this idea of how your economic arrangements relate to the ways that people participate. Thank you. So I just wanted to, to offer, I guess, a bit of analysis and a bit of, of theory at this point. Um, being, being drawn from my PhD, there is a bit of this in this webinar series and I hope that you find it interesting. Um, so. A conventional look at the way that we structure our economic arrangements 
or you know, a conventional look at a business model would focus on the capitalist transactions, the capitalist interactions that are happening. So um, they would it would look at, you know, the fact that you purchase your turbines from a company, you sell your electricity to a retailer, um, and you know, workers workers work for a wage as employees and contractors work for contractor fees and um, you know, banks loan money and shareholders expect a dividend and they get a dividend. So that sort of business as usual understanding. That's one layer of what's going on here. But there are also other layers of what's going on here um, that are really important to see and to value um, because it's a lot of these alternative, what I, what are, you know, in a certain academic, this, in this framing are called alternative capitalist or non-capitalist practices that offer a lot of value to community energy projects. Um, and so what we can see in this table is you know, under alter the, al the alternative capitalist market arrangements are things like, yeah, you've got a share offer, but it's a share offer that prioritises local people, not just shareholders from anywhere. And it's a share, whole share offer that prioritises not just maximum profit to shareholders, but also benefit to the local community. So it's not purely capitalist in that it's profit oriented, but it is using market-based mechanisms and conventional mechanisms in a slightly modified way to still also achieve the other motivations that we have going on in this project. Um, it's also including things in under the labour transactions like in-kind contributions from local businesses where they, they might give you pro bono discount rates or they might provide um, access to staff for free. Um, it might also include things like contractors doing doing work for you and saying, "Look, you pay me when the project's up and running, when you've got when you're earning income and you've got the means to pay." Um, it might include things like sharing staff. Um, and in terms of alternative capitalist enterprises, it's things like co-op, where you have the ability to to trade in the market, you have the ability to return a dividend to your shareholders, but you also have the ability to uphold things that are important alongside making money. So things um, things that are going to benefit your members and benefit the things that they care about. <clears throat> and then as we move further down into the, the non, what's considered non-capitalist um, economic arrangements, they are things like um, voluntary contributions. Um, so people, people who are gifting their time or gifting their space and resources um, things like sweat equity, um, and in terms of um, the marketing interactions that are non-capitalist, it's things like um, people making donations. It's it's people um, making um, knowledge sharing, so making information available at no cost. It's it's grants. They are not a capitalist um, source of finance. And then over on the enterprise side, it's associations, you know, not-for-profit associations and, and um, you know, um, trusts. And it's um, a situation where you're not, you're not returning any of the surplus to individuals. There's no dividends paid. It's going all purely to, to community benefit. So this is just, this is a way of helping conceptualise the fact that Although in our dominant world, in, in the dominant way we think about economy and finance, we might see that top capitalist layer. But in fact, we have a lot of different options um, and we do draw on them as community-based projects. We draw on them all the time and it's a lot of these diverse, what I call diverse practices. So they're going beyond capitalist, they're, they're going to alternative and non-capitalist practices. This whole diversity of economic arrangements are actually what help to uphold and make community energy projects viable. Um, and I think um, it's really important for us to recognise this because it, it, it opens up the space of opportunity that, that community energy projects are able to operate within. We have a lot of constraints and there's a lot of challenges, but we also have a unique access to, um, 
to these diverse economic contributions by virtue of having a community of people around us that are also really committed to the vision that we're trying to achieve. Um, the last thing I'll just mention in, in this sort of general overview of economic arrangements is that different economic, different sources of finance are going to make sense at, um, at different stages in a project and for different types of projects. So this is just um, a schema that we de developed at Community Power Agency that shows on the left hand side there, um, it's the different stages of a project. So your, your inception and your feasibility stages through to your, your planning and then your capital raising and construction and operation phases. Um, and then as you move from the left to the right, you've got your smaller projects and then your larger projects that are pioneering, that are the first time you've delivered these projects, first time they've been done in Australia. And then as you move across, it's your, your smaller but proven projects and then your larger but proven projects. And um, in the early stages of almost any community energy project, it's going to be volunteer effort and donations and possibly grants that, that really gets you going in that first instance. Um, and then other sources of of finance will come in and different options will be available. If, if it's a pioneering model, it's going to be more likely that you're going to be able to access a grant. Um, and, you know, of course, as many of you know, until you've proven the financial viability of your project, until you've done all your feasibility studies and you're able to issue a prospectus um, or, a, you know, a share offering, you're not able to go out to community investors to raise finance from, from your community. So that only really comes into play as a, as a finance option later in the process of developing a project. Um, yeah, and at that point, you know, once you've got a proven business model, a proven business case, you can go to the community for investors. You could seek, um, you could go and seek debt finance or loans, um, or a com combination of those two things. And your ability to access um, angel, um, angel finance or loans or community investment might be increased when you've moved from um, a pioneering model, a new model to a proven model. So that's just a bit of a representation of, of when you're likely to be able to consider different finance options. Okay, so this is uh, another point for pause for some questions. Great, we definitely have questions. I'll go back okay. to a question that was asked some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is from Alan. Uh, from the world of, uh, of employee ownership, I'm aware that participation has to be structured to be both encouraged and effective. It's a two-way street. How do you do this in community energy? Um, hmm, good question. I think, I think being clear on um, the specific ways that people can be involved and Often um, you'll move from very for, like general forms of participation that might be um, available through your community engagement activities. So they might be through people coming along to an event or a celebration or a forum, people talking to someone on a stall, and they'll move from there to more specific and more targeted ways of participating through becoming an investor, donating to the project. Um, becoming a member and having the opportunity to be on the board or, you know, participate in a working group or go to the AGM. So, um, I do, th it is, it is a balance. Encouraging more participation means you're managing more people and um, you're managing more opinions. But at the same time, you're able to bring in a lot of resources and a lot of contributions to the project that are really valuable. So I would say um, the way to make it really effective is to have a clear idea of what you're trying to achieve through participation and then have really clear pathways for the different ways that people are able to contribute. 
and so in the form of decision making and this is sort of crossing over into into you know the realms of governance and and community engagement beyond the economic arrangement but for example in in thinking about who participates in what decisions what decisions are open to what what level of participation is really important you know some some decisions are purely the remit of the board some decisions you might want your broader membership to to be involved in and some decisions you might want the whole community to have some say in. So it's about being um, conscious about what you're trying to achieve through that that particular means of participation and being conscious about why that's appropriate in this instance. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, Genevieve, how do you prioritise locals with a share offer? So in one of your slides you were saying you might choose to prioritise yep. locals. I think it was that previous one. Um, do you give people within a certain region higher returns? How? how? Yep. Um, so there's multiple different ways that you can do this. So you can set the minimum share offering at a lower rate for locals. So for example, Hepburn Wind, Wind did this. Um, the rate for locals to buy in as members of the of the cooperative was one hundred dollars versus the minimum investment for non locals I think was a thousand dollars or was it five hundred but either way they they structured it so that um, it was cheaper for locals to buy in than for non locals but in addition to that through the approvals process people had to um, had had to nominate their address and they didn't cross-reference or check this, so it was people self-nominating as locals, but they trusted that people, people, you know, were being honest. Um, and part of the review process was um, was prioritising local applicants. And they have um, they have a policy, so it's not in the constitution, but they have a policy of wanting um, at least 50% local members. Um, other ways you can do it, you can release the share offer first to a specific geographic area and say, you know, at the moment only people within these postcodes can apply um, and then, you know, allow as many people as want to invest, invest and then after a certain amount of time broaden it out to maybe include, um, you know, a broader region, maybe the state and then if you still need more money you can broaden it again to include national or, you know, whatever it is that helps you to balance your pragmatic needs with your desire for the local, majority local members. Okay. Um, I'm sensing there's a bit of a theme coming through with the questions, which I'll just, I'll just sort of name it, just so that we can think about it, which is that it, it's, a lot of these questions I think are asking very practical. How can, how can we actually yep. do it? Yeah. Yep. And I think what your okay, research so is about is theoretical. Yeah. Yep. So the next the next section is all about um, case studies and, and how it's done. So maybe we should move to the next uh, section. Fabulous. So? Yeah. And I, I think so. There's a couple more questions. We'll try and run through them quickly. Shouldn't take too long. Um, look, my my answer to that question about how do you prioritise locals would be um, you you can do it any way you like as long as you don't do anything you're not allowed to do. Mm. So there are certain rules and regulations and cultural norms and so forth. So. Um, there's, there's a diverse set of ways you can prioritise mm -hmm. locals. Um, yeah, and you, you but, yeah. yeah. All right, next one is, um, this is more of a comment than anything, so we can run through this one quickly. Not sure where it fits in. Um, this is from Kevin. Not sure where it fits in, but community projects which include customers in the community energy means the customers are very sticky, which, which has a high economic value. I think we can take that as yeah. a comment, but any other comments? That from me? Yep. Yep, absolutely, you're right. Um, as I said earlier, like the link between a community energy project and a retail customer is currently convoluted, it's not direct, but you're right. And um, if a community energy project is wanting to develop a relationship with a retailer, the fact that their members are going to be sticky customers is really valuable. Okay. Fabulous. The next one, I think, will probably, it's, I suspect there might be a bit of a hidden detail in this question, and it might be best if we revisit it after the next section. I'll just name the question, but let's only talk very briefly, and then we'll revisit it. 
after we've gone through the case studies. How can anyone invest in power generation assets with a 25 year life without any guarantee of selling the power generated at a profit? And I guess I'm, I'm concerned this question might be asking us uh, uh, almost a market condition question. Um, let's come back to this question in the next section. Mm. And Andrew, please feel free to follow, follow up with an additional you know, question uh, delving deeper into that one. I've, I've started the chat with you. Yeah, and I mean, I guess it, very briefly, usually um, you would be doing a whole bunch of market research and you'd be signing power purchase agreements or at least looking into project, you know, market projections for what you can sell your electricity at and you'd be trying to minimise that risk by entering into a power purchase agreement contract. So, um, yeah, it would be really hard to get people to invest in a project that had no idea of what it was going to do with its electricity, but that's generally not what, not what people do. Um, yeah, but yeah, you, one, of, one of the options you put up there in alternative capitalist, I think, was... Um, no, as non-capitalist was, was no dividends. And I would take that to mean you put your money in and then a specified period of time later you would get your money back. Um, well, there's, a, there's, an old, there's another model which you probably referenced in your slide as well, which is donating. So mm. I, I, you perhaps might think of it as, as a spectrum. You know, how on earth could you convince people to donate? Well, how on earth could, could you convince people to give their money now and and receive it 25 years later, how could you convince yeah. people to put their money and get a return when there's a high level of risk? These are all related questions yeah. um, and determining the answer to them is actually critical in deciding how you're going to structure your offer to make it appealing to your community. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think the thing to remember is that people involved in community energy projects are, are usually motivated by a whole range of things um, and financial return is sometimes one of those things that motivates them and sometimes not. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of benefits and, and outcomes from community energy projects that people can value enough to donate to a project, um, for example, or to, to expect a very low rate of return or to be able to be willing to accept a, a very high level of risk that they may not recoup their costs. So, um, yes, yeah. but let's, let's move on to some of the examples. Um, so, as I've mentioned, I'm drawing primarily on the, the four case study examples in my PhD and that's because through that research process I, I gained a very detailed and, um, yeah, a very in-depth level of knowledge around these projects. Um, they are Hepburn Wind in Victoria, I'm sure you're all <laughs> aware of that project, Denmark Community Wind Farm over in WA, um, Shappensee Development Trust, which is in Orkney, and the Sky Renewables Cooperative, which is in the Isle of Skye. So all of these projects, um, when I when I when they up, when I did my research, they'd been up and running for at least a year. So they were selling electricity, generating an income. So they'd gone through that feasibility process. They'd gone through the the process of figuring out how to finance their projects, um, and then they were into the operations phase. They were all at least a megawatt, or you know, the smallest was 900 kilowatts, um, and the largest. Uh, was was a 12% share in a 27.6 megawatt wind farm. Um, so they're all quite significant projects. And again, this was just sort of helpful in, in being able to really um, look at what happens in local communities, what are the outcomes and impacts when, when you go through this process of setting up a community-owned renewable energy project together. So I'll briefly introduce each of them and then we'll talk through um, their economic arrangements. So Hepburn Wind, um, for those of you who may not know, is a 4.2 megawatt project. Um, it's a two turbine project down uh, near, near Dalesford in Victoria. It's owned by a cooperative with 200, um, sorry, 2,000 member investors and at least 50% of them are local people, or more than 50% of them are local people. So each year Hepburn Wind has been able to prioritise providing $30,000 to a community grant fund um, and they have also um, started to provide a return to members. 
a return on the investment to members. And in addition to that, they, you know, they've relied very heavily on volunteers. They've attracted a lot of in-kind contributions, and they also employ local staff and and really prioritise local contractors as much as possible in their build. So that's sort of snapshot of Hepburn Wind, and we'll hear a bit more about them as we go through. Um, Denmark Community Wind Farm is again a two turbine project. It's 1.6 megawatts. It's owned by a public company in which there are 116 local shareholders, sorry, 116 shareholders, um, and more than 50% of them are local people. Each year they give $15,000 to, again, to a community grant fund, and that's one of the, the main financial, local financial benefits. Um, and they also provide uh, returns to their members. Um, they've been doing this since their first year of operation and um, so far the returns have been 6% or, or higher. Um, they also relied very heavily on local local volunteers through through setting the, the project up but also ongoing through in the management and operations phase. The Shappensy Development Trust is a bit different um, they are a not-for-profit organisation that owns a single turbine on a very small island in Orkney. And um, the members of the, it's, it's a local development trust that is not-for-profit. Um, and the members of the island are all able to be members of the trust for you know a nominal fee of a pound. Um, and 100% of their members are local people. Um, they sell all of their electricity into the grid, as all of these projects do. Um, the difference with Chaffancy Trust is that 100% of their surplus is returned to their charitable purpose, which is to do with um, progressing the, the development goals of, of the island, so helping to make the island more sustainable and providing services to people on the island. They um, employ quite a few local staff, and, but again, also relied very heavily on volunteers to get the project up and running. Um, the Isle of Skye project is different again. This is what I'd call a partnership between a corporate development and, and a community cooperative. So a corporate developer set up a, a, large, a larger project on the Isle of Skye. It's a 27 megawatt wind farm. And um, a community cooperative owns a share in that wind farm. Um, so the, the community cooperative has 200 members, 80% of whom are local people, um, and what they've bought into is actually a royalty right in the surplus of the wind farm. So they're guaranteed at least a 6% return each year. Sometimes the return's been as high as 12% because Sky is an awfully windy place. Um, and um, again, the co-op is run by local volunteers. But um, I guess the difference is the co-op actually has nothing to do, had almost nothing to do with setting the wind farm up um, and has nothing to do with the ongoing management of the wind farm. So they're involved really just as, um, as a co-investor in the project. So that's a snapshot of the four projects. Um, Across the, these four projects and across you know, all community energy projects, as I've already introduced earlier, there's a whole range of diverse, really diverse economic practices being used to make and to, to create and sustain their energy projects. Um, and it's a lot of these economic arrangements that provide opportunities for participation. Um, and some, some community energy projects demonstrate a greater range of economic diversity than others, and it's often from the diversity of their economic practices that, that enable um, different ways of being involved, different ways of participating. So, when this is the participation footprint diagram again, but it only includes the aspects that relate to the economic arrangements in the project. So, I'm going to talk through um, these aspects in turn now. So we're going to unpick and deconstruct um, this this diagram as we go through. So the first thing that I'll speak to is the member finance. So member finance is, you know, you can do through donations or through investment, but basically where your membership, the people committed to your project, the people committed to your vision, 
are contributing their money to help make the project happen. Um, so this is you're sourcing finance from people who are really intimately um, they're really behind the project. They're really you know supportive. Um, so through this might be through donations or through investment um, and. The investment, as I mentioned before, can be done in a variety of ways. It can be a, a share offer, it can be cooperative credit unit, unit it could be green bonds. Um, but the level of participation is influenced by the percentage of member finance in the project. So how much of the project, how much money do you need to raise and so how many people are going to need to be involved to get that amount of money. So for example, in Repower Shoalhaven, um, a, pro a community energy project in New South Wales, they set their projects un up under a private company. So that actually had some limitations on how much money they could raise and how many people could be involved. And that capped the level of number of people involvement at 20 people. So, um, you know, your different choices um, do, um, and this is where it overlaps with, with your governance model, which we'll be talking about about next week. They do um, limit some of your choices available in terms of how, how many people can be involved. Um, with a co-op and with a public company, for example, you can have an unlimited number of investors. So, um, for example, as I've said, Denmark Community Wind Farm has 116 member shareholders and Hepburn Wind has 2,000. Um, one of the, the recent successes in Victoria, the community power hubs, they've, over the last two years, between the three community power hubs, they've delivered 15 projects. And a lot of those projects have been, been able to proceed through donations from the community, which is, you know, a really amazing testament to the, the just the commitment of the community to wanting to see renewable energy happen. Um, as I said already, also Chaplaincy Trust, which which is um, a not-for-profit organisation, they chose not to have any member finance at all. Instead, they structured their project through 100%, um, what 90% debt funded. So 90% is a loan from the bank, and 10% was a grant. Um, and so what that meant for them in, in in pursuing that option was actually they totally shut down the opportunity for participation through their finance. Um, and, and that's actually had some really big implications for them in terms of, um, you know, they pay out all of this money out of the community to an external bank instead of being able to retain that economic benefit locally. But it also means that their members are not as invested in, so they're not literally invested in the project. So it, it does weaken the ties. So when you look at the participation footprint and you look at, um, the percentage of member finance in the project, you'll see that um, in Hepburn, they had a very high percentage of member finance um, of the $12 million it took to fund that project, $9 million of it was raised through through member finance. Um, in Denmark, similarly, they had a very high level of member finance through shareholding. The rest of it was, was grant funded. But you'll see, um, Chaplaincy there, they had zero member finance. So that really limited the participation in that aspect of the project. Um, and then if you move around one more and you look at the number of individuals participating financially, you'll see again, Hepburn wins on the outside with 2,000. Um, Sky is next with 660 members and then Denmark with 116. And, and um, again, Chaplaincy didn't have any members participating financially. And just a note on some of the research around why local economic participation is so important for delivering local economic benefits. There's been quite a few studies looking at the difference between locally owned projects and absentee owned or, you know, corporate owned projects where the corporate is from outside the region or outside the country. Um, and really the, the level of financial benefit coming back to the local community is so many magnitudes better, bigger, when it's locally owned. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, you know, leave you to explore the figures. It's probably not worth going through them one by one. But just to say, 
if local economic benefit and you know regional development is a, a motivation, thinking about how um, you can source your finance locally is is really fundamental. Um, in terms of thinking about local jobs and local contracts, obviously um, providing local jobs is a really amazing and high high impact way. To, um, to increase local participation, but also to support regional economies and regional development. Um, and same with finding ways to prioritise local contractors um, and sourcing local services, which community projects are often good at doing because they're well networked in the local community and they know what services are available. Um, but some of the projects, for example, Chaffancy Trust, they worked with a local earth, earth moving company to really help them understand the local requirements that the, the wind turbines were going to have so that when it came time to doing the groundwork, that local company was able to take up that opportunity and able to, to put in a competitive bid and you know they, they really understood what was going to be asked of them to provide. So um, there are certainly ways that community energy projects are able to not only to prioritise local contractors but to make sure they're ready to make the most of the opportunity. Um, uh, sorry. Of course, um, local jobs and local contracts also helps to build local skills and those the availability of local skills can have ongoing impacts for people in, in the ability to for them to seek future work opportunities. Um, in the recent review of the outcomes from the community power hubs, for example, the people involved were surveyed to ask what their perception of the outcomes had been, and many of them, many many people commented on the different, the whole different range of skills that they'd learnt. So, from skills to do with governance, to do with finance, to do with community energy business models, to do with community engagement, so a whole range of skills. Um, and really importantly, a lot of them felt those skills would go on to make them more employable. Um, so I think the impact that that can have in small regional communities is also really important and it's fundamentally an outcome of being involved and, and participating in the project. Um, so when you look at the participation footprint in terms of the number of local paid staff, um, you can see the different different levels of staffing that the different projects have been able to realise. So Chaffancy, because they're a not-for-profit um, association and they direct all of their surplus towards providing, um, reaching their charitable purpose, which is all about providing services and opportunities to their community to support um, the ongoing viability and development of their community. So they provide a lot of services. So a lot of their income goes towards employing staff. Um, you know, staff to support elderly people in their homes and staff to, to run different community programs like a community bus service. Um, so they've got a lot of staff. Um, Hepburn Wind has, um, at, when at the time I did this research, I think they had two ongoing staff. Denmark has a part-time bookkeeper um, and Sky had no ongoing staff. So that just gives you a bit of a range. Um, and then moving around to, what would that be? be like seven o'clock, prioritising local contractors. You can see again that the different projects had different approaches to prioritising local contractors and some of them achieved a lot more local content than others. Um, just in terms now of voluntary, in-kind and gifted contribu um, contributions to the projects, this is a really big um, really big area where community energy projects are really different from corporate projects um, and this is one of the main ways that community energy projects are able to reduce some of their cash requirements is through the fact that they do rely heavily on voluntary labour, particularly in the early stages of the project. Um, and they're able also to, to get other people in the community excited about the project and committed to it and other businesses and organisations. Able, to, able and willing to contribute in-kind contributions. So, um, 
for example, all of the case, oh no, not all of the case studies, but um, Denmark, Hepburn and Chappensee in my research all started with local volunteers forming, for, forming a group and putting in, you know, many hours every week for years to get the projects up and running. And I'm sure that many of you who've been involved in community energy, you know, understand what, what that's like. Um, it's not always possible and it's not always sustainable. Um, there, there is a level of volunteer burnout that can happen um, and that's something that needs to be managed and not taken for granted. But at the same time, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that volunteering isn't um, a valuable and important and viable contribution when, as well. Um, a, a recent, an impressive stat that came out of the Community Power Hubs program recently um, was that across their their three different hubs, uh, they had a lot of a lot of people involved in um, volunteering for the projects and, and helping to get the projects up and running. Um, they delivered overall, they've delivered 15 community energy projects across the three community power hubs that um, together add up to 1.3 megawatts. Um, and in that process, they attracted almost $500,000 worth of in-kind and voluntary contributions of time and knowledge and resources from 150 different people. So that gives you a sense not only of the financial value of the in-kind and voluntary contributions, but also of the number of relationships that have been built up um, through those contributions. And they, they are people who are committed to the project succeeding um, and they, they're going to have an ongoing interest and support in those projects. And, you know, in Hepburn Wynn's case, having 2,000 members has been really valuable because they have those members, but then they also have a much bigger list of supporters, for example, that sign up to their newsletter. They've been able to mobilise those people into um, political action, for example, when the renewable energy target is threatened. So having that network of strong local relationships of people and organisations that are committed to the project is a bit of a, um, an insurance policy to some extent. It's, it's a, a, a base of support you can draw on for future resources and future support as well. I think it's also worth mentioning the value of, um, it happens a lot in community energy with projects sharing with each other, but it also happened in the Community Power Hub pro program and particularly the role that Sustainability Victoria played where they helped to facilitate knowledge sharing. Um, so sharing different templates um, and providing a networking role and um, making sure the information was being shared between different projects and as well as providing um, in-kind access to meeting space and um, guest speakers like us. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so th there's, there's a lot of value in those in-kind and those voluntary contributions. And um, every dollar that you don't have to spend is less money that you need to raise through other forms of finance. So it is, it is really valuable. Um, I also wanted to show you this diagram, which is just a representation of a single event. So Hepburn Wind runs um, celebrations and events at their turbines. And they don't they don't really they don't have budget to run these, but they feel like they're really important for the community. Or they have a very low budget to run these types of events. But they feel it's really important to bring the community together and allow that interaction between people and the turbines and to, you know, to have that that visual and that really visceral experience of the community around the project. So um, this example here is the Sleep Under Sleep Under the Stars event that happened a few years ago. Maybe some of you were there. Um, and they delivered this event through drawing on a whole bunch of volunteer and in-kind contributions. So all of the green um, circles are different organisations that were involved in delivering this event. Um, and it involved um, the painting of the murals on the turbines, as well as the festival event that included camping and music and storytelling and food. And, um, and so through bringing in all of these different local organisations, they were able to raise $70,000 worth of value 
So in discounted promotional material, in donated paint, in um, in in-kind contributions to the security guards, through um, discounted stage hire, through people volunteering on the gate to help set up and, you know, all of these different contributions that had financial value, it delivered a community value in terms of bringing the community together, but it also built relationships with all of those organisations and all of the individuals involved. Um, And so that's a really, really strong networking and relationship building exercise. So in terms of looking at our web, um, you can see here we're looking at um, uh, uh, five o'clock. So the number of local people contributing time and effort unpaid, so voluntary um, contributions. And the next one along at six o'clock, the number of organisations and businesses contributing in kind. So the footprint um, for those indicators being larger where there's been more um, more people and more organisations contributing voluntary and in-kind contributions to the project. Um, in terms of where the surplus goes, um, uh, the surplus, so I use the word surplus to refer to everything that's left over after you've accounted for the cost of running the enterprise, so the cost of um, you know, your insurance and your maintenance and your staff. What's left over and what do you do with it? Um, so in, in Hepburn Wind and Denmark Community Wind, for example, they distribute some of their surplus as returns on investment. And they don't, not every year, this hasn't happened every year, but um, they are able to return some of their surplus as returns on investment. Um, and they also direct some of their surplus towards a community grant fund, towards a, a community-wide benefit. Um, so this table shows um, the different contributions as a total dollar amount, as a per megawatt contribution, and as a percentage of the total surplus. So um, you can see there that Chapancy Trust, they deliver 100% of their surplus every year to um, community benefit, and it comes to quite a lot of money, um, $120,000 a year, um, which is very good for a 900 kilowatt turbine, partly because the UK had a great feed-in tariff at the time, partly because they live in the windiest place in the world. Um, Denmark Community Wind Farm, they contribute 10% of their project surplus to the Community Grant Fund. And this was actually an amount, um, what happened, uh, what Denmark Wind Farm did was they kept track of all the volunteer hours that went into setting the project up. And at the end, they said, all right, we're going to, we're going to value each of those hours at $40 an hour um, and say that that's worth $200,000 worth of volunteer contributions that went into getting this project up and running. And they um, they took out $200,000 worth of shares as sweat equity um, and they gifted those shares to a not-for-profit association. And it's, the not-for-profit association uses the returns from those shares, from that portion of shares, to fund their community grant fund. So that, and that comes to, you know, it'll fluctuate with um, levels of return, but it's, it's based at, a, it's a, been around um, $20,000 a year. Um, Sky Co-op, they haven't really done, they, they had the opportunity to distribute some of their surplus as a community benefit, but most years they've actually just returned it all to their, to their members instead. Um, Hepburn Wind has, um, they've got a commitment to contribute $30,000 a year to their community benefit fund. Um, And, you know, in some years when they haven't made as much money as they projected, that's actually been a really significant portion of their income. But they've also created, um, their relationship with the energy retailer is what contributes a lot of the funding to their community benefit fund. Um, through recognition that you know that they sell their their energy to um, now to power shop that was originally red energy um, and um, the um, sorry in recognition that 
the customers that that PowerShop accesses through Hepburn Wind are very sticky customers and that's valuable, PowerShop makes a contribution to the community fund. So one way or another, Hepburn, Hepburn Wind's committed to a community fund of $30,000 a year that provides, you know, and these community funds go to funding all different sorts of local initiatives. So the, the grant programs are different for, for the different communities and they prioritise what's important for, for, they, for that local community. So in Chaffancy Trust, it's, it's everything from um, helping local farmers do further education to help their farming practices um, to providing funds for the Girl Guides to access new materials, whereas um, Denmark's fund is focused on energy and sustainability issues and, and goes towards you know things to do with energy efficiency. Um, and Hepburn Wind Fund has has been a really a general community fund that's funded you know community choirs and community arts projects, but also has a strong energy focus that that's had ongoing ripple effects in the local community in terms of action towards renewable energy and energy efficiency. So where the surplus goes influences um, how the local community benefits and whether there's a general benefit to the whole community um, as well as if, if there's dividends being paid to local shareholders. So on our web here we can see at um, 9 o'clock surplus going to community-wide benefit per year, so that's through the community grant fund. Um, and um, and next at 10 o'clock there is about the number of individuals and organisations that have benefited from the grant fund. So it's partly about how much of the surplus is going there but also how many organisations and individuals have benefited through that process, through that grant making process. And all of those things together, how that adds up to a picture, you'll now hopefully have a much more comprehensive understanding of what goes into making this participation footprint um, and the different number of connections and contributions that have gone into a larger participation footprint as opposed to a smaller participation footprint. Um, I think I'll skip over that one because it's too theoretical um, and we'll go to questions. Okay, so a couple of questions have come through. Um, we might just, um, before we go to any new questions, we might just revisit that question about <clears throat> anyone investing in power generation assets within a 25 year life, life without any guarantee of selling the power generated at a profit. <clears throat> Do any further reflections or thoughts on that question beyond what's already um, been said, Joe? Can you, can you read the question again, sorry? How can anyone invest in power generation assets with a 25 year life without any guarantee of selling the power generated at a profit? Yeah, I actually feel like we probably did, everything I've had to say, we did discuss that earlier, mm. unless you wanted to add anything, Tom? No, no, I'm, I mean, if, if another question comes through that's clarifying that well, question, we're happy yeah. to address yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Two questions. Um, uh, first one, what impact will the crowdsourced equity funding laws for private companies have on the future of financing community energy projects in this country? Any opportunities? Um, yeah, absolutely there's opportunities. So it, it makes it easier to source um, investment, you know, based finance and shareholding. Um, from the general public. Um, so, and for public companies, there's an unlimited number of um, potential shareholders, so that provides an unlimited opportunity for a number of people investing. Um, and, and there's also an unlimited limit on the amount that you can fundraise through a public share offering. So, um, I think it will, but one important thing to remember is that cooperatives have also had the ability and they have always had the abil ability to to raise funds in this manner. Um, I don't know, Tom, you might actually have, do you have anything to add to this question, answering this question? Yeah, I mean, at one point in time I made it my business to be really across what was happening with crowdsource equity funding. My knowledge is a bit out of date. Um, Thinking about this question in the context of your presentation, 
community participation. You mentioned earlier, Jarrah, that Repower Shoalhaven were limiting their investment to 20 investors. That's because they're a private company. So yeah. at face value, the crowdsource equity funding laws for private companies seem to be a solution to expand the numbers. Yeah. Without yeah. going into a big critique, and I could be critical, um, <clears throat> there, are some, there are some limitations mm. that come with the new legislation. And perhaps the best way of saying it would be um, the lack of evidence of any community energy groups adopting the crowdsource funding legislation, which was introduced in September 2017, or it became active in September 2017, mm. is probably a guide to how useful it is in the real world. Yeah, and I think what we what we've seen community energy projects doing instead is continuing to use the private company as is, um, or using a cooperative based legal structure, which enables the same benefits as as what are enabled through the crowdsourced um, funding. Yep. All right. We'll move on then. Um, the next question is: uh, What is involved in issuing a green bond? to community members. Can a community group incorporated association do this? Is it costly? Um, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I don't yep. know very much about green bonds, um, so I don't feel able to answer. Sorry. Yep, um, I'll, I'll make some comments. Uh, 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 answering the question would require, uh, this is definitely beyond the scope of this presentation, um, answering the question would require an understanding of the definition of what a green bond is. A green bond is a type of bond. A bond is a way for an entity such as a company or any other incorporated entity to raise money and it's described as being similar to debt. Presumably an incorporated association can issue bonds. Um, it probably is costly. Um, what a green bond is is much less clear and it's obviously a type of bond which has green characteristics attached to it. Um, we're not legal advisors. We we can't give any advice on that, um, but uh, I think we kind of can't answer the question um, more than we already have. Sorry about that. Um, I've got a question or comment for discussion. Um, can we have another look at the spider diagram? Um, <clears throat> my comment on Schappenstey having no investors is that their decision to not have investors m might have been driven by a desire to not have value being drawn by a limited m number of people in their community. Yep, absolutely, you're right. And if they were developing a participation footprint for themselves, they probably wouldn't include those two metrics percentage of member finance in the project, number of locals individually participating financially, and their footprint would actually be a complete footprint yep. covering the maximum possible area. Mm -hmm. It looks yeah, a bit well, like Chapinsay performs poorly compared to, say, Hepburn, but that's only because mm -hmm. of the metrics that you've chosen to display. Um, and yeah. different people with different objectives might choose to display different metrics. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, and that's why I see this as being an exploratory tool. It's not about making hard, fast judgments about what is a better project or a you know, more appropriate way to do a project. It's just it's an exploratory tool. And um, what this helps you to see is that through choosing not to have member investors, um, and or even donations from the community through not having member-based financial participation. They have limited the ability for people to participate financially in the project. Um, and when I when I was in Chappancy and it was they, their project had been operating for a number of years, they people who were very involved in the project as well as general community members were really pissed off that they had gone down the route that they had, that they had funded the project 90% through debt because it meant two things. Um, it meant one, that they were shipping off a whole bunch of economic benefits in their loan repayments to an offshore 
uh, company. And two, it meant that they actually had, they seeded their ability to make decisions about their project because the bank owned the project. And they had to get approval to do certain types of things. Um, Chapinty has grid constraint issues. So they've actually been curtailed 40% of the time. So they were, re they were losing an enormous amount of revenue and they wanted to do a whole bunch of behind the meter energy initiatives to address that issue, but the bank didn't allow them. So they actually, they ceded that ability to have control over their project through choosing debt finance. So um, the reason why it is important to, to have visibility into that is because um, having member finance, where your finance is coming from people who are committed to the vision of your project, protects that vision and the ability to achieve that vision over time. And this will overlap when we talk next week about governance because um, it, it relates very closely with who's in, who has decision-making power over the project and who, who's involved in that. Um, no more questions, so do you want to keep rolling and talking about what's next, Jo? Yeah, sure. So in terms of what's next, um, as I've just alluded to, there's a lot of overlap between the economic arrangements and the legal structures. Um, and next week we'll be talking about legal and governance structures and um, particularly the choice of legal structure influences um, the, the purpose and objectives of the organisation and how you're able to prioritise those. Um, how you're able to distribute the surplus, whether that needs to go, you know, entirely back to a charitable purpose as, as for not-for-profit, not whether you can distribute it to as dividends to your shareholders. Um, and of course, as we've already mentioned, it places limits on the maximum um, amount you can raise. In some instances, certain legal forms place limits on the amount of money you can raise as well as limits on the number of people. Um, so those overlap, um, as well as other governance-related issues we'll be talking about next week when we talk through governance structures. Um, and the week after that, we'll be talking through community engagement practices. Um, and as with this week, we'll be um, both introducing what I mean by governance and sort of talking high level and then getting into the detail um, and exploring the detail through case study examples. Thank you, Jarrah. Where okay. can we find recordings of the webinars? Uh, I don't know, Tom. You tell me. <laughs> um, several places. Probably the easiest one is the Coalition for Community Energy website, C4, the numeral, c4ce.net.au. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone.